50% of health is determined not necessarily by a person's biology, their genetics, but by the environment in which they live. I grew up thinking that I was predestined to be diabetic or have hypertension because I was black, because my grandmothers had them and they were black and black people, we say it to each other and Latinos, well, we're gonna get it. And now I understand that it's not about my race, it's about my neighborhood. Most of the city is a food desert, which is language that we've stopped using. We really suffer from food apartheid. And when people are talking about food deserts, often they talk about it as it relates to grocery stores. But it's also about farmers markets and farm stands and produce stands. And it also doesn't tell the whole story because often when those healthy foods are absent, there is an over-proliferation of really unhealthy food. So for a while, I called where I live a food swamp. And then I stopped because not much good can grow in a swamp. And a lot of good can grow where I live. So I wanted to use language that really told the story of why it's that way. It's not, we just don't happen to have grocery stores. Poor neighborhoods don't have grocery stores. And disproportionately, low-income neighborhoods of color don't have grocery stores. And this is not just in Massachusetts, this is the entire country. And it really tells that this is a story about a system that many of us don't even know exists. But if we don't name it, we can't fix it. Into the places where we live, one of those social determinants of what my life is going to be and helping change things there, maybe my kid won't see the inside of a hospital much. And it's this multi layer so we're working to improve school food and also starting school gardens and when you have three-year-olds who are learning how to grow food and tasting lettuce and fresh greens and cherry tomatoes can you imagine what they'll be like when they're my garden students when they're in second and third and fourth grade they'll be teaching me they won't need me they'll be gardening at home that changes how you grow up it changes what you think about yourself and and when kids grow food, it's not just about a garden. We have transformed blocks of neighborhoods. If you can, instead of driving every five minutes and seeing fast food, you drive every five blocks and there's a school garden or a neighborhood garden or a garden at the library because even the things that this initiative isn't directly funding, there's still all this extra outgrowth, then what I think I can do changes. And I know that to be true because it's happened for me as a grown-up. I never grew anything, and now I have a massive garden that my neighbors eat out of, and I teach children. I taught some this morning how to grow food, and our district is building a culinary center to feed more kids better food, and Maggie Witten, our program director, is helping me think all the time about policy and systems change, and we're going to amend our school wellness policy, and we're going to amend our procurement policy so that when Tim and Mark and I are all gone, these policies will be in place and kids five or ten years from now who I'll never meet will have access to all of these things. I have changed my community so now I think I can do anything so if that happens for me imagine if you're six years old or ten years old what are the possibilities for your life so they're changing physical health but they're changing emotional health they're changing the landscape for generations to come and so you can see the potential health impacts that go way beyond this little initiative.